Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I want us to turn in our Bibles to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 17, and um, I want to take a page from the late Bishop Walter E. Bogan. Oh, see, I'm going back. This is a nostalgia day. I want to take a page from him. I'm calling this series, The Chemistry of the Blood. Yes, The Chemistry of the Blood of the blood, the chemistry of the blood, chemistry. Don't know much about chemistry or history. <laughs> what is chemistry? It's a branch of science that studies the properties and the behavior of a thing. Therefore, when we talk about the chemistry of the blood, what we're talking about is the properties and the behavior of the blood of Jesus. And so I had you to turn to Leviticus 17 because here is our first chemistry lesson. Chemistry lesson number one, the blood is life. The blood is life. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Somebody say with me, the blood blood. is life. The blood is life. The life of every living thing is located in its blood. In fact, if blood is not allowed to touch every cell and every part of your body, that part of your body will die. I wonder if that's true about the blood of Jesus. Well, Jesus says in John 6, 53, let me read it for you. He says, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say to you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, notice, you have no life in you. You have no life. Without his blood, we have no life. That's what we need to realize, that our life is located and found in his blood. And this whole principle of the life is in the blood is is even brought to an even higher um, level when you consider that this blood is the blood of the Son of God. So the life that is in us is not just a life, it's the life. It's eternal life. So every part of your body that has eternal life, (laughs) that part is alive. Now, the interesting thing, the reason why I had you stay there in in Leviticus 17 is, the interesting thing is this word life, that's translated life in verse 11, is the same word that's translated soul. Let's read it again. Leviticus 17 and 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The word life that appears in this verse and the word soul is translated from the same word. 
The word is, the Hebrew word is nephesh. Let me give you a definition. This word life or soul, nephesh, it means inner life or self. It means inner life or self. It's what one is to oneself as opposed to one's outward appearance. So when he's talking about the, the life of the flesh is in the blood, he's not just saying the vitality of the body is in the soul. He's not just saying that the blood gives the body energy. What he's saying is who you really are, yourself is in your blood. Think about that. Everything about you is encoded in your blood because everything about you, not just your hair color and your eye color, but also your idiosyncrasies, your tendencies is all encoded in your DNA and that DNA is in your blood. This is the basis of what Many people often refer to as generational curses. If you heard that phrase before, generational curse, the generational curse isn't so much a generational hex. You know, that's what we think of a, a curse as a hex. It's like I, it's impossible for me to achieve because somebody done put a, a voodoo voodoo on me a hex on me, and I can't succeed. No, what's generational is not the hex. What's generational is the sin. And it's the sin that keeps bringing the curse. Everything you are, you put it in the life of your children. It's in your blood. That's why you got to be careful, women, who you marry. Because the life of that man, because the blood of the children comes from the father. Hey, is this thing on? I said the blood of the children comes from the father. And his blood goes into every child. And when he says the blood goes into every child, his life goes into their child. And when he says his life goes into their child, his very nature his very being, not what he appears to be in front of your parents, but who he is to himself goes in. So now you can see why we need a blood transfusion. We need new life inside of us to counteract, to go against the life that we have innately. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 26 and 28, let me read it for you, because stay right here in Leviticus, Matthew 26 and 28, he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. And what is it for? For the remission of sins. And so what Jesus does in this passage, he points out another important property or function of blood. And that is this, blood purges. The blood of Jesus purges from sin. The blood of Jesus removes sin. It purges. You know, there are two primary functions of the blood. It supplies nutrients, life, vitality, minerals to every part of the body, but it also takes with it and removes waste from the various parts of the body that it travels to. So it comes and it delivers and it takes. I said it delivers and it takes. Jesus' blood is the same thing. It delivers and it takes. It cleanses, it strengthens, and it cleanses. It gives and it takes, cleanses, purges. Now, Jesus says his blood was shed for our sins. And this word shed is really the word poured out, poured out. 
And it points back to the sacrificial system where blood was used to atone for sin. So Jesus is like, he's like, he's like, you know, dropping hints about how his blood actually purges by using the word shed. Again, that word means to pour out. Pour out? What does that mean? Well, that's a, a reference to, it's pointing back to the sacrificial system where blood was often poured out or given to atone for sin. In fact, this is what we see here in Leviticus 17. Are you still there in Leviticus 17? Look at Leviticus 17 in verse 11. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So what God is saying here, he says, because the blood is so closely connected with the life or who you are, I ordained that blood be used in order to atone for your soul, for your life. Because blood is connected with life, then God says, I can use the blood to atone for your life, for your life. So this atonement, you know what it is? It's really an exchange. It means to reconcile things. When you're reconciling, you're giving something in exchange for something else. We call it making amends, expiation, meaning that when I hurt you, then I give you something in return for that. That's called reconciliation, right? To reconcile means you've got to make a change, right? You've got to make a change. That is, you've got to take and give something in exchange in order to make that thing right, to make an exchange. And God says, I have given you blood and use that blood because it's so closely connected with life. It represents a man's life. I've given you this in order to make an atonement, to make an exchange, to take away your sin and give you something in return. So I want us to go back a chapter to Leviticus 16, because here in Leviticus 16, it gives us a description of this act of atonement. Leviticus 16 and verse 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So what's happening here? God is teaching us of how atonement works. This is a description of the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, you might have heard that. That's been in the news recently Amen. with Hamas attacking Israel. They attacked Israel 50 years. It was an anniversary to when they first attacked Israel in 1973, and they did it on Yom Kippur. They did it on the Day of Atonement. And here, 50 years later, they did it again. Israel got attacked on the day that they were supposed to be getting protection. Mm. I'm going to let you think on that. All right. So he says here, he gives a description of how the high priest was to offer atonement on the Day of Atonement. And he says, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was to take two goats. One goat was to be given to the Lord and killed in place of 
the other. Now, you might be wondering, why is he taking goats and not lambs? Well, because the goats represents us in our rebellious state. We would like to think that we're lambs. The guy says, you're just a bunch of goats. I say, come, and y'all don't come. I say, sit, you don't sit. Give me two goats, please. Can I have two goats? Mm-hmm, can I have two goats? And so they cast lots, and they say, okay, which one of these goats going to get it? Boom, and it fell on Jesus. How I many know it fell on Jesus? Jesus was in the garden. Lord, let it pass with me. He says, oh, no, the lot fell on you. That's why we can go to God and say, Lord, let it pass for me. He'll say, okay, because it fell on who? Jesus. And so the goat on which the lot fell was killed, and he was killed in the place of the other goat to teach us this is what atonement basically is, somebody taking our place. Now, what happened to the other goat? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, he says, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So the lot that fell on the goat that didn't get killed he was a, that goat was allowed to escape judgment. So that goat was called the scapegoat because it escaped judgment. And he says, the Lord did this to make atonement. Well, I thought the death of the other goat made atonement. So how can the alive goat make atonement? Well, you got to understand that this word atonement is really the word reconcile. In fact, if you jump down to verse 20, Leviticus 16 and 20, he says, and when he had made an end of reconciling, I thought he was atoning. Well, the words are the same, reconciling. So the atonement is a reconcile. So because Christ took our place, guess what we get to do? We get to reconcile with God. Reconciliation represents our relationship with God. Our relationship with God has been restored because Christ took our place. I said our relationship with God has been restored because Christ has took our place. He took his blood, which represented his inner life, his soul, and he gave his inner life in exchange for our sins. In Colossians chapter 1, turn over there. Let's look at it. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, it reads, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to, notice, reconcile all things unto himself, and you, somebody say, and me, and you that were sometimes alienated, enemies in your minds, remember that goat, enemies in your mind by wicked work, yet now, say now, now. hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. It was through the death of that goat that the scapegoat could stand before God alive. And see, I think sometimes we miss that when the Bible talks about life. When the Bible talks about life in relation to Christ, it's talking about righteousness because that's his inner life, holiness, righteousness. That's real life. That scapegoat is able to stand before God holy, without blame, without reproof, righteous because the other goat took his place. 
Now, what I want you to see here in Colossians 1 is that this holiness, this, this posture, this reconciliation that we have before God, notice it is in God's sight, meaning it's not in our sight. We don't feel holy. We don't feel that we are unblameable. We probably feel, we probably still feel, you know, worthless. This is what Paul was battling in Romans chapter 7 when he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. It was hard for him to process this. He says, This reconciliation is something that happens in God's sight. This atonement that Jesus made for us is something that happens in God's sight. And we can't really see it. This is why we really struggle with feeling like we are righteous before the Lord. One of the reasons for this is because this reconciliation, and we're going to see this in a minute, is something that happened privately inside the tabernacle. The other reason why we can't see it is because when God does it, he does it while we're still sinners. Go to Romans chapter 5. This is another reason why we can't see it. See, you're trying to say, I don't see it. I, I just don't see it. I, I'm just, all I can see is my mistakes. That's because he does it when you're still in your mistakes. Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, that's why we're, that's why we're talking about this. We're doing a little chemistry. We're doing, we're in a, see, we're in a lab. We're in a lab today. We're trying to see how these things work. Romans 5 and 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, the goat died. Christ died for the ungodly. What do you mean a goat? Well, because he took on sinful flesh. He became a goat for us, not on the inside, oh, but on the outside. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made, that we might be reconciled. He's that goat. Notice, verse 8 again, he committed his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Just two verses down, he calls this reconciliation. But what I want you to see here is this atonement, this reconciliation takes place while we are yet sinners. That God says, in my sight, you are holy, you are without blame, and I'm doing this before you do anything. Because I want you to do, know that this is an act of love. It's an act of grace. And he calls it here justified. Now that's a fancy word that simply means that we have no guilt before God. It means, to, it means that the case that was against us has been canceled. See, justification is for our conscience. Justification tells us, no, we went to court and the judge said not guilty. Now, even if we feel like, man, I did that, I should be paying. The judge says, go home. I'm telling you, go home, go home. <laughs> he says, but I, but I was speeding. Go take your license and go home. You are not guilty. That's what it means to be justified. That's for your conscience. That's what, that's what Jesus says when he says, my blood is for the remission, the removal. What's being removed is the guilt. What's being removed is the remembrance that, oh, man, I owe God. You don't owe God. It's been removed because he took the debt. <clears throat> 
He paid the debt that he did not owe. I said he paid the debt that he did not owe because we couldn't pay it. And God says that your debt has been paid. You are now justified in my sight. And so what the battle is, we got to make our sight like his sight. We got to learn how to see what God sees. This is why we're taking the time to paint this picture because it's many times hard for us to see it in real life. It's hard for us to see it when we look at our daily life. So let's look back and see this, this, this process of atonement and put ourselves in that picture. And whenever the enemy tries to come and bring this condemnation, I want you to take your mind back to them two goats. I want you to remember what God said to that one goat that was left. You can go, little buddy. <laughs> it's a scapegoat. Oh, it's more to that. We're going to get to it. But for now, just understand, he lets you go free. He lets you go free. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> now, this is just the beginning of the work that the blood does for us before the Lord. Jesus didn't just give his life that we might be justified. He also gave his blood. Somebody say his blood. His blood. That we might be covered. Hmm. Now see, this is why I'm struggling. I don't know about you, but I think about these things. If Jesus gave his life for us, why does he have to give his blood to cover us? If his life was given for the remission of sin, what was the purpose of taking this blood to the altar? We're going to get to that because that's, that's part of what they did. So they, <clears throat> they didn't just, you know, kill the goat, but they also brought out a bullock. And they killed that too. They killed one for the high priest, and then they killed the other one for the people. Now that ma really makes you scratch your head. Because we know Jesus is sinless and he don't need a bullock. So why is this high priest playing out a picture that Jesus doesn't do, at least in our minds? Well, you got to remember, when he rose from the dead, after he was shown to be sinless, what did he do? He says, touch me not, because i got to go to the Father. What was he going to the Father to do? To atone. But he had to do it after he was proven to be sinless. That's why he wouldn't let the women hold on to him. He says, wait, I'm not done yet. There's a two-step process to this. I have to go, and I've got to do something with this blood that I just shed. And what did he have to do with it? Well, you turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Somebody say, the blood covers. The blood covers. What is it covering? If our sins have been remitted, what is it covering? Well, that's a good question. See, we should ask these questions so we'll dig deeper. Hebrews 9 and 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Here in Hebrews, the writer is actually pointing back to the Day of Atonement because the Day of Atonement was the one sacrifice that was only performed once a year. Once. So when the writer says only once a year, the, it's clear that he's talking about the atonement here. And notice what he says, that he took the blood, he took blood into the holy of holiest says here in verse 7, he went into the, the high priest, went into the second part. If you know anything about the temple, there were two parts. 
the holy place, and then the most holy place. That's where the blood was taken, into the most holy place. So, and notice what he says here. He says he took the blood in there, and what was this blood for? According to Hebrews, it was for the errors. Now, that's an interesting word. The word error there means sins committed in ignorance. So there more, there's more sins than we know. I mean, we're sinning all the time. We don't even realize it. Think back to when you were a kid and you got out of the shower and said, I'm clean, mama. She said, come here. Let me see. <laughs> then she went behind your ears, right? All the places you forgot and showed you, you missed this part, you missed that part, you missed the other part. This is what the atonement is for, the parts we missed. Jesus died for the parts we see. His blood is for the parts we missed. He died for the parts we see. I know I did this, Lord. But he says, I'm going to cover you because I know you trifling and you missed some spots. So let me just cover you. And I know we say, oh, it's all right. My daddy, he loved me. He said, in love, I'm holy in his sight. He said, come here, come here, come here. You don't know the Lord like I do. Let me cover you. Trust me. What do you mean, trust me? Well, go back to Leviticus 7, 16. I'm going to show you. Leviticus 16. We're coming somewhere. Come on, we're coming somewhere. Sometimes we think, oh, I do. I confess my sins. You still need the blood. You need the blood for those sins you ain't confess. Oh, I did forget. I did do that. Yeah, you forgot that too. Oh, but thank God for the blood. Because if you had to remember everything, you wouldn't get to the parts you, you really need. Now, Lord, I really need this. You'd be so, you spend so much time. And oh, let me remember. You had to go get your phone and see if you could you put it in your text or whatever. No, that's what the blood is for. Leviticus 16. Let's jump down to verse 13. Leviticus 16 and 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not and he shall take the blood of the bullock see not the goat see this is a different side of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Now, even before we get into it, I don't know about you. I'm like, look, don't be, I'm like, I feel like Peter. Don't sprinkle me, Lord. Clean my whole body, you know. Ah, see, but there's a reason why he didn't pour it out. He sprinkled it to show you any cooks in here. There are, there are some herbs that you just need just a little bit. It's so potent. It's so powerful. It's so effective that only a pinch. And you take the rest and throw it over your shoulder because I don't need that. I just need, a, I just need a little bit. I just need a little bit. That's all I need. It's set. It's, oh, that's it. That's all you need. And that's to show how wonderful this blood is. You just need a little bit of it. If you poured it all out, you know, I need all of it. No, you don't. I'm so good. You just need a little bit. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. What I want you to see is that notice before the high priest could go and sprinkle the little bit, he had to take incense. And he had to put the incense on the fire. And the Bible says he had to fill the entire room, the inter sanctum, with the cloud of incense. Why did he have to do that? To hide from his view the mercy seat. Because on the mercy seat appeared the glory of God, the presence of God. So the incense 
needed to cover his view. You know, like the Navy SEALs when they walk into the building and they don't want to get, they put down the smoke bomb so they can walk by so they won't see them. He put down his smoke bombs, which were his incense, so that he wouldn't see the glory of God that appeared on the mercy seat. And why did he want to block that view? I would want to see God. No, you don't. Because the Bible says if you see the Lord in your sinful state, you will die. Think Uzzah, who touched the ark of God and perished. You don't want to see it, so it's like, that's what I said before. The thing that's happening is in God's sight. God don't want you to see it. He wants you to believe it. You're trying to wrap your mind around something that's spiritual, something that's for him. So he hid himself. Now, this is important because the next part points back to this. The next part is he was to take some blood and sprinkle it, the Bible says, on the mercy seat. Sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Why sprinkle it on the mercy seat? Because it had to cover God, who stood above the mercy seat, from what was below God. What was below God? The ark. I know we often think that the ark represented God. It didn't. The presence, the Shekinah represented God. You ever heard that term before? Shekinah. It comes from a Hebrew word that's been transliterated that means to dwell. God wasn't the ark. He dwelt above the ark. You know who the ark is? We are. Because what's in the ark? The testimony. What needs to be written in our heart? The testimony. What else was in the ark? Aaron's bud. Aaron's, Aaron's rod that budded represented the authority that God gave him. That's what's in us, the authority. And then the other thing that was in the, in the ark was the manna, the word of God. That needs to be in us too. We have all of these things, the manna, the authority, and the testimony. We are that ark and above us like the children of Israel was when they were in Egypt. When they were in their houses, what was above their houses? The Lord was above their houses. And what was between the Lord and them? The blood was on their doorpost. And what was that blood doing? Protecting them. It protected God above from the people below. It was the blood. And this is what he's doing. He's sprinkling it so when God looks down, he only sees his son. When God looks down, he only sees the atonement. When God looks down, he only sees the sacrifice. When God looks down, he only sees Christ's holiness. And that's what you are. When God looks at you, he's not looking in your box. He's looking at the blood. That's what it means to be under the blood. That's what it means to be walking in the blood covering. This is what the blood has given to us. I wonder, do we still have that covering today? Romans chapter 3. Do we still have that covering? If so, how do we gain it? They gained it when the high priest went into the tabernacle and offered it. How do we get it? Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified, there's that word again, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a, notice, propitiation. Same word as atonement or reconciliation. A propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He's saying here that we have this same atonement. Only he calls it, in the New Testament, propitiation. 
But this word is the same word as atonement. If you go to 1 John 2 and 2, it, it uses, it, it trans, it's translated atonement because the word propitiation means to cover. That's what atonement means, to cover. Because you want to know why? It comes from the same word that's translated the lid to the ark. The lid or the covering of the ark is the same root word of atonement and propitiation. Because it wants you to understand that that lid is your covering. What's on that lid, which was the blood. To have the propitiation, to have the atonement is to be under the cover. To be under God's covering. So that every time God looks at you, he doesn't see your mistakes. He sees the blood. But notice who this covering is given to. He don't just throw this blanket out on everybody. It's given through faith. This is why we're taking the time in the lab to examine the properties of the blood so that we can get in faith about what's happening that does it, we don't always see. We need to be seeing this. We need to be seeing this. Why? Because we got to walk in this. You know, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, when the high priest went into the holies of holies to offer atonement, they didn't see anything. They were standing on the outside. You know what they had to do? They had to take the testimony of the high priest when he came out. And when he says, it's finished, they had to believe that and walk in it for the rest of the year. And to walk in it. And guess what God is saying? When God, Christ says, it's finished, I did it, boys. I did it, girls. It's done. You've got a covering. When we go out, we ought to walk out like we know we're under the covering. Because this blood, like the incense, is hiding us from the judgment of God. It's hiding us from the terror of God. The terror is sweeping throughout the world, but guess what? We're under the covering if we believe it. If we believe it. Hebrews chapter 10. And see, when you realize this, when you realize what the blood has given you in terms of your relationship with God, it will have an impact on you. And Hebrews tells us what that impact is. Hebrews 10 and 18. Now where remission of sin is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. What do we have when we know that the blood has atoned? We will have boldness to come in the presence of God. We will have boldness to come in the presence of God. Not this, oh, Lord. Mm. I know, I know, Lord. I know, I know, I know. I'm terrible. I'm awful. Jesus says, I've given you a covering so you can come bold. I know you feel like I haven't been in church very long, but you got to understand that this blood didn't start when you got in church. This blood wasn't a, it's not your blood, this is his blood. God's not looking at your accomplishments, he's looking at Christ's accomplishments. And he says, when you come before the presence and you understand that you're in this blood, it will give you boldness. And why do we want this boldness? So that we can shout in church? So that, so that we can stop feeling like a second-class citizen before the other saints in the house of God? No. Go to Hebrews 4. I'm going to show you why you want this boldness. Are you all out there? Hebrews 4, 15, for we have not a high priest. Here it is again. See, all these verses that we used to read, now we're seeing it. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched 
with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come sadly, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find to help in the time of need. You won't find mercy, you won't find grace if you don't first find boldness. And you won't find boldness if you don't see the blood. You don't have boldness because you've been good all week. That's not the boldness that gives you confidence in God's sight. Because remember, you can do everything you think you need to do, but when you come before him, there's still something behind your ears. See, that's the problem with a lot of these, uh, these other uh, so-called religions that are popping up. You know, I'm thinking of one in particular that's grasping the attention of a lot of African-Americans these Hebrew Israelites who claim to be sent from God and reminding people that the reason why you don't have favor with God is because you're not keeping the commandments. But you can't keep the commandments and be righteous in God's sight. Paul says, let it be known that no man is justified in the sight of God by keeping the law. Because there's always something, you've, there's always something behind your ears. You're going to miss something. And I'm telling you, just a little something will bring the wrath of God against you. Because our God is a holy God. And he is a consuming fire. See, I, I think we don't have a high enough estimation of who our God is. Our God is the holy one. In him there is no darkness at all. No darkness can even dwell in his presence. If you take that to account, no wonder we're not coming to church. No wonder we don't pray, because we know God don't play. But what we've lost sight of is that the blood has been shed for us. It's been sprinkled for us. It's been applied to us. It covers us. It atones. It reconciles. It justifies. Therefore, knowing that we have a high priest, let us come boldly. Let us come boldly. Because we've been great? No, because we're under the blood. And obtain mercy. And find grace to do what? To live up to it. To walk in it. See, so many people are trying to live up to it and then get grace. It's the other way around. You get grace so you can't live up to it. I said, I'm talking to a lot of people out there that's trying to live up to the expectation and then ask God for mercy. Lord, have mercy on me because you know I've been serving in the church. Lord, have mercy on me because you know I've been coming to church. I haven't missed one day in nine months. You're trying to get mercy on the basis of your works. But mercy doesn't come from you. It comes from your high priest. It comes from your high priest who has done something in the presence of God for you. Say, for me. But we don't see it. We don't want to see it. Why don't we want to see it? Because we're just some goats who want to live independent of God. Who want to be able to stick our chest out and say, I finally did it. Who wants a that a boy? He wants a that a girl? Who wants God to applaud us? But God's not in the business of applauding you. He's given his worship to one man. He's given his worship to one person, and that's the Lord Jesus. That's the one he honors. That's the one he honors. When the disciples were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they saw two, uh, two of their most famous patriarchs, Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus. Peter, in his brassness, says, let us make a tabernacle in honor of all three. And the Bible says, God waved his hands, and Moses and Elijah disappears. And he says, behold, my son, 
see him. This is what we do. God brings us to the mountain of his holiness. And we're always looking to religion. We're always looking to men. We're always looking to prophecies. When we're not looking to the one who really gives us a, a boldness in God's presence. And that is Jesus Christ and him alone. Some people that are listening to me today, you're looking too much to your church. You're looking too much to your pastor. You're looking too much to your mama who prayed for you. You're looking too much to men, and you need to look more on the Lord Jesus. You need to look on him, what he has done. Stop looking to flesh. Stop looking to men. Stop looking to denomination. Stop looking to religions. Stop looking. Stop looking for another prophecy. Stop looking for another revival. Stop looking for another breakthrough and look to Jesus who has already finished it. Say, God, give me a revelation of the blood. My estimation of the blood is too low. It's too low. The sprinkling, it was enough for you. Why is it not enough for us? The sprinkling, the sprinkling. The sprinkling, the sprinkling, because it's potent. Everyone standing up on your feet today, hallelujah. We need a revelation of what's in the blood. We need a revelation of how it's working in our favor. Oh, Father, I pray today that you would remove from our sight every idol, every person, every institution that we've placed on the level of your son. Everything we've been looking to. Maybe it's our own ingenuity. Maybe it's our own intelligence. Maybe it's our own ability. Maybe it's the support and network of the people around us that we're looking to. Maybe it's, maybe it's its institutions and systems that have been put in place to give us confidence to face tomorrow. But let us not put our confidence in the flesh. Let, our, let us not put our confidence in any work of man. But help us today, Lord, to see Jesus. More specifically, help us to see the blood. Help us to see what you see. Why is it so amazing to you? Let it be amazing to us. Why is it so en enough to you? Let it be enough to us. Give us to see like you see. Give us to see that we are holy that we are without blame, that we are without reproof, that we have been justified because we believe. That's what we need. Lord, give us a gift of faith. We pray the prayer that the man prayed to Jesus, Lord, help my unbelief. Oh God, I pray today. Faith comes from you, Lord. Give us a gift of faith right now, right now. Everyone who's listening, put it in our hearts, Lord. Put it in our heart. Touch our eyes. Touch the inner eyes of our heart and enable us to see Jesus. We're like the men on that day before Christ gave his life. We would see Jesus. Lord, we would see Jesus and not our sins, not our mistakes, not our failures. We would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to see the blood, the power of this blood in atonement, in reconciliation. Oh, Father, I thank you today that this day forward, we will have boldness in your presence. We will have boldness in your presence. That whatever the situation demands, we'll know that we'll able to, we'll, we're able to obtain grace. We're able to obtain mercy. 
Yeah, we're able to attain it because you're pleased by the blood and you're pleased by our faith. And Lord, I thank you now that this work is being performed in every willing heart, every willing heart. Do you want it today? Do you want this faith? Lift your hands today. Oh, the Lord give you now this gift of faith. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened. And in the name of Jesus, cause you to see and to comprehend the work of Christ for your life, the atonement, the justification. And Father, we thank you today. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth, and showing the love. Use me, Lord.